So my biggest advice to young people is get work experience as early as you can so that you are further ahead of the other people that you're going to school with. Episode 133. This is the Business of Architecture. Welcome back, Architect Nation. This is the show where you'll discover tips, strategies, and secrets for running a profitable and impactful architecture practice. If you believe that it's possible to make money and do good, then this is the show for you. If you aren't already on the Business of Architecture email list, make sure you claim your free account on businessofarchitecture.com by clicking the green Join Today button. I'm your host, Enix Sears. Today's show is sponsored by BQE Software, the makers of ArchiOffice. ArchiOffice is the office and project management software built with the needs of architects in mind. And for a limited time, startup firms can get two free seats of ArchiOffice for a year. Go check it out at ArchiOffice.com. Today, we're going to talk about firing the client and getting control. Have you ever worked with a client and thought, if I were in their shoes, I'd do things a bit differently? Maybe you've daydreamed about what you'd do if you held the purse strings and had 100% design control. Would you design your projects the same? Now, what if you could make a profit off the project and not just collect a fee? Today's guest is on just that. On this episode, you'll hear from the CEO of one of San Diego's premier boutique urban residential developers. After losing everything in the Iranian Revolution, his family moved to California to start from scratch. Sohail Nakshab is the CEO of Nakshab Development and Design Incorporated. His company designs, develops, and builds beautiful contemporary single and multifamily projects, which both add to the local community in San Diego and make beautiful spaces for people to live in. On this episode, you'll discover how Sohail Nakshab developed his first project, the most important step you should take if you want to get started developing your own projects, what got him started early in life, and how he got to where he is today. And with that, here's today's show. So Sohail, what is up? A lot, man. I'm going crazy over here. Working too much? <laughs> Way too much. Ah. Way too much. What do you, what do you have going on right now? Uh, we, our business is set up where some of our projects are our own personal design build projects. And some of them are people that hire us cause they like our style. And then I'll end up designing the project and building it for them as well. So, um, Currently, we're doing uh, a new mid-rise building in downtown San Diego. That's our own property. So it's a uh, it's going to house our fu- our office, our future office. Um, and personally, my family are going to occupy about three or four of the units as well. So it'll be kind of like a multi generational complex. And then the remainder of the units, there's a total of nine units in this building. We'll rent out the balance. Um, so that's underway. And then we have a couple spec homes uh, that we're building right now and a few more that are in the pipes to, to get started. Um, design wise, uh, one of my fun projects that I get to work on, I have a project out in South Africa that this uh, family hired me to design. They live in Johannesburg and then they bought a property in uh, Cape Town so I was fortunate enough to get flown out there, take a look at Cape Town, take a look at the site. And we've been putting together the plans to hopefully have permits ready by January to break ground on that project as well. So it's busy, busy. Yeah. We're having, um, so yeah. So what, what, <laughs> and what's your, what, what does your day look like at NDD? What is kind of your role, the kind of things you find yourself doing? Um, uh, we're a boutique office. I have about uh, four people in the office that work for me. Uh, you know, their, their roles range from drafting to office management to accounting to structural engineering to architecture. I mean, you name it. You know, each of them wear multiple hats because we are a small business. I end up wearing more hats than they do because I have to oversee what's in the office. I have to oversee what's in the field. My brother operates the field, um, but I still have to kind of have a lookout on everything just to make sure details don't get missed with what we're trying to accomplish with our projects. So I I, I probably work like 
70 hours a week. And fortunately, because I love what I do, it's more of a hobby than a job. So I get a lot of grief from my family because I work a lot, but it's not really work. I think it's, it's more fun. Um, there are times in business where you do get stressed out, um, you know, dealing with institutions for financing. Clients can wear you down because they become so emotionally attached to their projects, um, nitpicking at, you know, really minute things and making them uh, big issues when they're really not. So I get my fair share of stresses, but at the same time, I've had my fortunate fair share of nice, enjoyable, you know, events in, in my career. So, Well, let's talk yeah. about that. Tell me about the journey that got you to this point. Uh, I started at a very young age. Um, I was still in high school. My, uh, I have a lot of relatives that are in this industry. My father studied structural engineering uh, back in the 60s. He came to the States, went back to Iran. That's where we're from. Started his own development company there. And then revolution hit, packed the bags. Everybody came back to the States. We started from scratch. Uh, my father ended up getting a job working for the city of San Diego building department as a structural engineer. And through that, through the exposure growing up, I have my one of my uncles is an architect, another aunt, she's an interior designer. Um, I grew up around this environment. I was always into doing crafts growing up, building things around the house, models, you know, remote control things, whatever it was. And at age 17, I got my first job in a professional office because of my father's contacts. And I started building my work experience at a really young age. So pretty much by the time I was ready to graduate college, I had already started my company because I created this Rolodex of contacts in the industry. So it allowed me to just start working for myself right away. And then the support of my parents, um, bringing in my brother into the business, working as a partner with me really helped us get to where we are today. Um, none of what we've accomplished happened overnight. <laughs> a lot of people, they walk into our office, they're impressed by our work, they're impressed by what we're doing. But, you know, you're talking 10, 15 years of blood and sweat just to get to this point. So, yeah. Uh, and then as far as my education, I studied structural engineering as well in school. I did more of a classical approach to architecture. I wanted to be more of like the master builder, master architect, where I had an understanding of the structure, the aesthetic, and the construction so that I could do it holistically within one office versus outsourcing things. I just I wanted to have a better grasp of all the ins and outs associated with building design and building construction. And what did you what inspired you to do that? What made you think that was going to be a good business model? Uh again, early exposure to the industry, uh interacting with young people that had graduated with bachelor's and master's degrees in the industry. Um, unfortunately, architects don't get enough credibility in the workforce. So, you know, I just, I would see a lot of young people with master's degrees and they're basically just draftsmen and it was unfortunate. Uh, so I figured I'll make myself a little bit stronger in the industry and I'll get more of a technical degree because I personally think that you develop the aesthetic skill naturally. It's not something that you learn in school. You either have an aesthetic or you don't period so you know i i took that and i applied it with the technical and then i started my first construction project at age 18. we uh we did a design build for my uncle's home which helped me really start understanding uh, construction and you know slowly but surely adding all these pieces together got me to where i'm at so let's talk about those early days when you graduated from school. You said you had this Rolodex of contacts. Tell me about when you graduated. Tell me about your first job. So when I graduated, uh, I made all these contacts that I worked with at one of the larger architecture firms here in San Diego, and we became, you know, we were friends, and they knew that I had the ability to do, to do uh, structural engineering. 
So they started feeding me structural engineering work as a consultant. Um, and then at the same time, in parallel to that, my family, we decided to actively get into development. So we started buying property, designing homes, uh, and building them and selling them. So these two events kind of took place in parallel, which really helped establish the business. Um, and then, you know, going further down into the industry, I got more and more exposure, more and more experience. So we expanded from just doing single family developments to multifamily developments. Um, when it comes to the development, <laughs> it's a lot easier to get financing and create projects that are multifamily because the risk is not as high as uh, single family homes are. Single family homes, they're fun. Uh, it's a sculpture piece. And one thing that I've tried to do is take the concept of doing these cool, interesting single family homes and applying it to multifamily living so that people that are renters can actually enjoy some of the benefits that these million millionaire people that buy these homes from us have you know whether it's modern features uh, uh modern sustainable amenities that you find in a lot of uh new projects we try to incorporate a lot of that stuff um so that a larger demographic and group of people can actually enjoy it and experience it all right so i feel like i need to i feel like i need to go back in time a little bit farther because it sounds like there's there's family money involved here there's at least family connections and family support so, and I know you said your father came over here when was it the mid eighties? No. So we, uh, he originally came here in the late sixties, graduated from USC in the early seventies, went back home and, uh, in Iran, it's mandatory. Once you graduate from university, you join the military for about a year. He met one of his, uh, good friends in the, in the military who, uh, had an uncle who owned the largest private bank in the country. And the uncle basically approached my father, said, listen, I want to hire you and set you up uh, to run all of the development that we need done for our projects, our buildings, public buildings, whatever it is. So at age 27, he was lightning in a bottle, success. Uh, unfortunately, the revolution hit and we basically abandoned ship and came to the States with very minimal cash um, at hand. And fortunately, my father was familiar with California. So we situated ourselves here in California. And uh, he got lucky. He got a job in San Diego. He was interning for about six months with a firm in LA, um, just to get familiar with the system here in the States. And, uh, you know, he worked his way and landed a nice job for himself here that he was able to provide for us and give us a nice environment to grow up in. So uh, fast forward into the future, uh, my, as my brother and I started growing older, my father said, okay, you know, maybe we can sell the home we live in and let's go find a property and start doing work together. So my brother at the time, uh, he was a real estate agent. So he would go around with a video camera and film properties because my dad didn't really want to go and look at properties all over town. He would go film properties and bring them back home in the evening. We'd sit down and, and watch footage of what he had looked at. Fun. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So he was doing the legwork um, and he's really sharp when it comes to that stuff. Uh, we ended up finding something that we all liked and we all agreed on. So we sold the home we lived in and we went after this and um it was kind of interesting when we <laughs> when we approached our first family project you know we did our little napkin performa and figured okay this is what we're going to put here and this is how much it's going to cost us and our take home is going to be x amount our take home was like exponentially increased because we hit the 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 spike in the market back in like 0405 so that really helped catapult us and we took the income that we made from that deal and put it into other deals and we you know sticking together and not separating from one another really helped uh get us further along a lot of people uh within you know the, the american culture they tend to separate from each other um you know kids hit 18 they're out the door 
But in my household, I mean, I lived with my parents till I was about 27 until I got married. And, uh, you know, it's just nice to be able to have that support system where we support them. They support us. We work together. I think you can really get to your, your destination a lot quicker when you work as a group versus as just one. So, you know, we, we stuck together. Uh, we went through our second batch of development. We did three houses on three separate lots. And at that point, the market crashed. Um, so we ended up living in the homes. We lived in the homes. We survived the recession. And actually, we, we increased business during the recession because our business is so diverse. We weren't just focused on providing one type of service. Uh, we're, we were providing architectural service, structural engineering service, construction service, and then, you know, or all of the above. So that allowed us to stay above water and actually build our business while, you know, a, a lot of other people were closing their doors. Um, and, you know, coming out of the recession, you know, we were able to snag up a bunch of nice properties that we've turned into some successful uh, projects within our community that, you know, uh, we've received nice recognition for, um, and we've made a good living off of. So, well, and, and, yeah, and you you kind of laugh and smile when you say good living. So it must be must be a pretty good living, right? You know, we are frugal as far as how we spend our money. We do have a good living because we have a small footprint. Um, the I, I currently live in like a nine hundred square foot house that's attached to three more units. My parents live in the, in two of the other units. My brother used to live in the fourth unit, but he moved out because he wanted some more privacy. He's a, he's a bachelor. Um, but you know, he we didn't want to see the girl. They didn't want the parents to see the girlfriends. Come yeah, <laughs> he, was, uh, he was going through that and he just like felt uncomfortable. Um, now he's got a steady girlfriend, uh, that he really likes. So the comfort level could be different if he did move back. But uh, at that time, he just like, I need to get out. So we had another development that we just finished, uh, the Sophia Lofts project. I don't know if you've seen that one. So he yep. moved on to that property. Um, the other cool thing about our, our, our living situation is I'm like a, less than a minute or two minutes from my office. And then, you know, in a year from now when we're done with our current development in downtown San Diego, I'll be – steps away from my office because it's going to be in the same building as where I live. So um, it's a cool way to work and live. And it's not just the experience that I'm having. It's also my parents. They love it. I mean, mm. you talk to their generation, they're from the baby boomer generation and they're just so stimulated from the metropolitan uh, lifestyle. Um, you know, my mom, she doesn't even have a television in her, in, in the apartment, because when she looks out the window, she sees the, the city, it's alive. And that's stimulating for her. Uh, being able to walk out and just go to any cool public amenity, going down to, down the streets of the best restaurants in San Diego. These are all great features of, of our lifestyle that we've created. So we're not living the type of lifestyle that you see on television, the superficial lifestyle where you're living in suburbia and some 7,000 square foot McMansion and, you know, have 10 cars parked in your garage or whatever. Um, we're living that sustainable metropolitan lifestyle. It's, it's, it's a cool thing. Very interesting. Well, what's the, what are some of the keys to getting along with family and business? I mean, have there been disagreements where it was been difficult? Of course. I mean, it's not easy to work with family. Um, you know, when, especially with siblings, you grow up with siblings, you smack each other around, you get upset at each other. But again, the positive side to that is you forgive each other at the same time. So my brother and I have definitely grown up together and developed our business relationship and how we communicate with one another so that we're not getting out under each other's skin when it comes to the day to day operation. Um, my parents, you know, they've always been kind of the managerial position anyways, because they are our parents and that's kind of the part that they still play in the business. They'll be, they'll advise us on decisions that we're trying to make or, you know, participate in what direction 
we should go with a certain project, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, my brother and I, I want to say maybe the last four years, we've really developed as far as how we work together and how we treat each other. So there's a lot less intense moments, I want to say. And I think that just comes with, with age. <laughs> It also sounds like you, it sounds like I hear respect for your parents uh, and what you're saying. It sounds like you have, you hold your parents in respect. You work for them. You take their, their advice. I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that's common in American culture. So what's been different about your experience that has made you feel that respect for them? It's, you know, this, that's how we're raised culturally adults, the grown ups, those are the ones you put on the pedestal and they've sacrificed everything for us. All the opportunities that we've had to date have been because of our parents. We're very fortunate to have parents that have done what they've done for us, you know. Uh, so everything goes to them. Yes, we've also uh, aggressively taken advantage of these opportunities presented to us, um, but we wouldn't have had these opportunities without them. Um, so we really respect everything they've done, uh, you know, and we actively – will continue working with them as long as they're here with us. Mm. I, so, Hill, I always find it interesting when you hear about um, people who may have had prominent positions in their former countries, like you talked about your dad in Iran. You know, he had connections. Uh, he had prominent position. You know, Iran's a very wealthy country. And then, of course, political climate changed. He came over here to the U.S., had nothing, <laughs> and was able to build it back. I mean, like you said, what we don't see are all the blood, sweat, and tears behind the scenes. So, from your perspective, having grown up in his household, what would you say are some of the keys that you saw that your father demonstrated that allowed him to rebuild and be at a place where he's at and you guys are at right now, give you those opportunities? There's a few pieces associated with that. My father is a unique person. Uh, he, he is conservative, but he knows how to also take risks and chances with opportunities. Um, because of the background that he came from, I mean, he ran a company that he had 300 employees in Iran. I mean, that's a huge company for a young person. Uh, coming to the States and taking a job, a government job, was difficult for him because, you know, not a lot of people really have had the type of experience that he's had. But again, you know, you have to do what you have to do to survive. And in parallel to working uh, his job with the, with the city, you know, he was branching out. Um, he was doing side development deals while he was working, um, uh, you know, familiarizing himself with the terrain. Uh, he distracted himself with his hobby. His hobby is uh, his music. My father composes uh, ancient Iranian poetry into contemporary music it's beautiful um he's already put out like four or five cds so uh you know all these things we we have a very eclectic family i mean we're all into the arts we're into the music and then we also have the technical side with mathematics and science so it's kind of like co-merged all these things together um and then just the fact that my dad supports us he's not one of those types of fathers that says you're on your own, figure it out. It's like, okay, I want to hear your opinion. Let's do this together. That's his attitude. And he actually listens to our advice and our input. He's not stubborn, you know, typical old Iranian father that says my kids don't know anything. I know everything type of attitude. So he's a lot more forward thinking and liberal, which has really played a part in where we, where we are today. Hmm. So my wife and I were talking the other day, we were just driving around and we thought, you know what, um, as we get older, and if, if we have means, so if we have means to help our children and our children know we have means and our, our children come to us and they, they basically, uh, you know, they want a loan or they want something to be able, maybe they have a business idea, you know, um, we were kind of discussing what would we say in that, in that experience, you know, would we, would it be enabling, would it be damaging our kids to give them sort of the easy route by just saying, sure, we'll go ahead and back your venture. Or should we say, no, you got to learn the hard way and do it yourself. What's your perspective on that? I think if you see something in your children, if you see that they have the ability to stand on their own, but they don't have the means financially, 
I think there's opportunity there and that it's a good investment. But if your child hasn't really proven their abilities to really function on their own and stand on their own and be independent, um, minus the, the finances, then you're taking a risk. Mm-hmm. For us, you know, we work our asses off. And our parents have seen that. Uh, and just the fact that they're active with what we have gone after uh, gives them more security too. So, yeah. I'll do the same with my kids. I mean, I have two kids too. I have a, I have a son and a daughter and I would love for them to come into the same business and industry that my brother and I are in right now, you know, and I'll support them. Um, I'll get them started at a young age, similar to how my father got us started to get them exposed, to learn, get the tools, um, and be better than me. I mean, that's the thing. That was my father's whole goal is like, I want you guys to be better, learn from my mistakes, be better. Mm. promote your friends find friends that are better than you so that you can become better so these are all like our life lessons growing up (laughs) no distractions i mean we weren't even allowed to have girlfriends in high school no distractions (laughs) (laughs) that's that's powerful so your your business model right now is it is it holding on and renting out the units do you sell the units so preferably we're holding on we did recently sell one of our four unit buildings. Um, it was a good opportunity and we took it and we took the, the money that we made there and we put it on to the larger building that we're doing in downtown. Um, we have a few other multifamily properties that we're just holding. There were great development deals, um, beautiful projects uh, that, you know, long term, I think it just makes more sense to try to hold as much as possible. Obviously, you need cash to build yourself. So we, you know, we're being very particular about what we hold and what we sell. We're fortunate to have that ability right now. Um, so yeah. Well, if someone wanted to get started in this business, what advice would you give them? How would they get started? Uh, work experience. Go work for free intern that's the best advice i mean unfortunately young people nowadays they just go to college most of them wait to the last semester that they're graduating and they have to do an internship for school i find that kind of ridiculous um they need to be uh more proactive and just go out and hunt you know for an internship so they can actually see if they enjoy the line of work that they're about to get themselves into um they need to you know from my experience from what i've seen with people i've interviewed in my own my company they need to change their attitude about oh i have this degree so i'm entitled to getting paid this certain salary you have nothing to offer a company you have no experience yeah you learn some stuff in school but the industry is so different than school it's, it's very different so my biggest advice to young people is get work experience as early as you can so that you are further ahead of the other people that you're going to school with. Mm. And, and you can kind of zero down, you know, hone in on what it is exactly you want to do. You know, maybe you do an internship in your freshman year and you're like, you know what? Architecture, engineering, it's not for me. I want to go be a dentist. Well, you talk about hiring too. Let's hone in on that for a minute. What are you seeing when people are looking for jobs from you? Um, you know, you said sometimes there's, it sounded like there's some readjustment there in terms of their thinking, you know, uh, do you experience that people are entitled coming out of school, kind of expecting more than they really deserve? Uh, how, what are you seeing? So I've seen both. Um, I've seen where people come in and they have zero experience. They just show me what they, you know, I went to school for four years. I have a bachelor's degree. Okay, great. I know how to do AutoCAD. I know how to do Revit. Great. But it's more just for school projects. It's not really real life stuff. So I'm not really into hiring people like that. The ones that I do like to hire are the aggressive ones that show up in my office, uh, which work for me right now. So they'll just show up. I'm still in school. Uh, I really like what you guys do. And I just, I want to come here as much as I can. I could put 20 hours a week and I just want to learn from you. Okay, great. Come on by, come by tomorrow. No questions asked. Uh, 
or you know some of uh, some of the the employees that I have that have actually finished school, I'll go through their credentials. I'll see what their attitude is about work. Um, you know, what what are they here for? Mm. What do they want? You know, and based on the, the types of answers I get from them. I decide whether they're cut out for working in our environment or not. Our environment's a pretty cool, mellow environment. It's, uh, you know, you go at your own pace as far as, you know, what you want to do day to day. As long as you're hitting your targets, you know, making sure you're hitting your deadlines. Uh, we're pretty relaxed office, you know, play loud music, whatever you want to do. Um, you know, communicate with each other. Uh, it's not a, we're not, uh, our office is not set up where, I have to make all the decisions. I like to interact with everyone and get their feedback. Hey, what do you think about this? Give me your input. You think we should do this, do that? Because I think the beauty of doing a collaborative effort with projects is you end up creating something that is more appealing to the mass versus, oh, I really like this, so everybody else better like it because I like it attitude. So, I don't know. <laughs> I just went off on a tangent. But <laughs> No, I think it was right on. Well, and to our listeners, uh, go check out the website here. It's NDD Inc., I believe. NDDinc.net. Dot net. And you'll see some of the pretty incredible designs. Thank you. It's so, very nice of you. Yeah. Have you thought about starting your own practice or are you looking to take your practice to the next level? If so, I wanted to let you know that free registration for the 2016 Architecture Business Plan Competition opens on December 1st, 2015. Start your planning process now and enter for a chance to win a grand prize of $10,000. Five finalists will be flown to Philadelphia to present their full plans to four industry-leading jurors. Travel and lodging are provided. So this is a one-of-a-kind competition. It's open to all licensed architects in the United States and Canada who are planning to start a new firm within one year or currently own a firm that is less than 10 years old. Visit archbusinessplan.com to learn more. And that's a wrap for another show about the business of architecture. To get more resources about how you, as an architect, can run a rewarding business that is both fun, flexible, and profitable, visit businessofarchitecture.com and click the Join button to claim your free account to Business of Architecture Insider. As a member, you'll have access to free tools and resources to help you get more clients, start a new firm, and much more. You'll also get access to my book, Social Media for Architects, where you'll learn how to use internet tools for fun and for profit. Until next week, this has been The Business of Architecture. views expressed on the show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment except to help you conquer the world. Bump music credit to Ben Folds 5, Do It Anyway.